History of HIV AIDS, Wikipedia Audio AIDS is caused by a human immunodeficiency virus, which originated in non-human primates in Central and West Africa. While various subgroups of the virus acquired human infectivity at different times, the global pandemic had its origins in the emergence of one specific strain HIV-1 subgroup M in Leopoldville in the Belgian Congo in the 1920s. There are two types of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 is more virulent, is more easily transmitted and is the cause of the vast majority of HIV infections globally. The pandemic strain of HIV-1 is closely related to a virus found in chimpanzees of the subspecies Pan troglodytes troglodytes, which live in the forests of the Central African nations of Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Republic of Congo, and Central African Republic. HIV-2 is less transmittable and is largely confined to West Africa along with its closest relative, a virus of the Sudi Mang Abbey, an Old World monkey inhabiting southern Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and western Ivory Coast. The majority of HIV researchers agree that HIV evolved at some point from the closely related simian immunodeficiency virus and that SIV or HIV was transferred from non-human primates to humans in the recent past. Research in this area is conducted using molecular phylogenetics, comparing viral genomic sequences to determine relatedness. Transmission from non-humans to humans Scientists generally accept that the known strains of HIV-1 are most closely related to the simian immunodeficiency viruses endemic in wild ape populations of West Central African forests. In particular, each of the known HIV-1 strains is either closely related to the SIV that infects the chimpanzee subspecies Pan troglodytes troglodytes or closely related to the SIV that infects western lowland gorillas, called SIV -ger. The pandemic HIV-1 strain and a rare strain found only in a few Cameroonian people are clearly derived from SIV-CPZ strains endemic in pan troglodytes troglodytes chimpanzee populations living in Cameroon. Another very rare HIV-1 strain is clearly derived from SIV -ger strains of Cameroon. Finally, the primate ancestor of HIV-1 group O a strain infecting 100,000 people mostly from Cameroon but also from neighboring countries, has been recently confirmed to be SIV -ger. The pandemic HIV-1 Group M is most closely related to the SIV-CPZ collected from the southeastern rainforests of Cameroon near the Sunga River. Thus, this region is presumably where the virus was first transmitted from chimpanzees to humans. However, reviews of the epidemiological evidence of early HIV-1 infection in stored blood samples, and of old cases of AIDS in Central Africa, have led many scientists to believe that HIV-1 Group M early human center was probably not in Cameroon, but rather farther south in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, more probably in its capital city, Kinshasa. Using HIV-1 sequences preserved in human biological samples along with estimates of viral mutation rates, scientists calculate that the jump from chimpanzee to human probably happened during the late 19th or early 20th century, a time of rapid urbanization and colonization in equatorial Africa. Exactly when the zoonosis occurred is not known. Some molecular dating studies suggest that HIV-1 Group M had its most recent common ancestor in the early 20th century, probably between 1915 and 1941. A study published in 2008, analyzing viral sequences recovered from a recently discovered biopsy made in Kinshasa, in 1960, 
along with previously known sequences, suggested a common ancestor between 1873 and 1933. Genetic recombination had earlier been thought to seriously confound such phylogenetic analysis, but later work has suggested that recombination is not likely to systematically bias, although recombination is expected to increase variance. The results of a 2008 phylogenetics study support the later work and indicate that HIV evolves fairly reliably. Further research was hindered due to the primates being critically endangered. Sample analyses resulted in little data due to the rarity of experimental material. The researchers, however, were able to hypothesize a phylogeny from the gathered data. They were also able to use the molecular clock of a specific strain of HIV to determine the initial date of transmission, which is estimated to be around 1915 to 1931. Similar research has been undertaken with SIV strains collected from several wild Sudi Mangabe populations of the West African nations of Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Ivory Coast. The resulting phylogenetic analyses show that the virus is most closely related to the two strains of HIV-2 that spread considerably in humans are the SIV-SMM found in the Sudi Mang Abbeys of the Thai Forest, in western Ivory Coast. There are six additional known HIV-2 groups, each having been found in just one person. They all seem to derive from independent transmissions from Sudi Mang Abbeys to humans. Groups C and D have been found in two people from Liberia, groups E and F have been discovered in two people from Sierra Leone, and groups G and H have been detected in two people from the Ivory Coast. These HIV-2 strains are probably dead-end infections and each of them is most closely related to SIVSMM strains from Sudi Mang Abbeys living in the same country where the human infection was found. Molecular dating studies suggest that both the epidemic groups started to spread among humans between 1905 and 1961. According to the natural transfer theory, the simplest and most plausible explanation for the cross-species transmission of SIV or HIV, the virus was transmitted from an ape or monkey to a human when a hunter or bushmeat vendor slash handler was bitten or cut while hunting or butchering the animal. The resulting exposure to blood or other bodily fluids of the animal can result in SIV infection. Prior to World War II, some sub-Saharan Africans were forced out of the rural areas because of the European demand for resources. Since rural Africans were not keen to pursue agricultural practices in the jungle, they turned to non-domesticated meat as their primary source of protein. This overexposure to bushmeat and malpractice of butchery increased blood-to-blood -blood contact, which then increased the probability of transmission. A recent serological survey showed that human infections by SIV are not rare in Central Africa, the percentage of people showing seroreactivity to antigens evidence of current or past SIV infection was 2.3% among the general population of Cameroon, 7.8% in villages where bushmeat is hunted or used, and 17.1% in the most exposed people of these villages. How the SIV virus would have transformed into HIV after infection of the hunter or bushmeat handler from the ape-slash-monkey is still a matter of debate, although natural selection would favor any viruses capable of adjusting so that they could infect and reproduce in the T-cells of a human host. A study published in 2009 also discussed that bushmeat in other parts of the world, such as Argentina, may be a possible location for where the disease originated. HIV-1C, a subtype of HIV, was theorized to have its origins circulating in South America. 
The consumption of bushmeat is also the most probable cause for the emergence of HIV-1C in South America. However, the types of apes shown to carry the SIV virus are different in South America. The primary point of entry, according to researchers, is somewhere in the jungles of Argentina or Brazil. An SIV strain, closely related to HIV, was interspersed within a certain clade of primates. This suggests that the zoonotic transmission of the virus may have happened in this area. Continual emigration between countries escalated the transmission of the virus. Other scientists believe that the HIV-1C strain circulated in South America at around the same time that the HIV-1C strain was introduced in Africa. Little research has been done on this theory because it is fairly young. The discovery of the main HIV-SIV phylogenetic relationships permits explaining broad HIV biogeography. The early centers of the HIV-1 groups were in Central Africa, where the primate reservoirs of the related SIV-CPZ and siv gr viruses exist. Similarly, the HIV-2 groups had their centers in West Africa, where Sudi Mang Abbeys, which harbor the related SIV-SMM virus, exist. However these relationships do not explain more detailed patterns of biogeography, such as why epidemic HIV-2 groups only evolved in the United States, which is one of only six countries harboring the Sudi Mang Abbey. It is also unclear why the SIV-CPZ endemic in the chimpanzee subspecies Pan troglodytes schwein furthii did not spawn an epidemic HIV-1 strain to humans, while the Democratic Republic of Congo was the main center of HIV-1 Group M, a virus descended from SIV-CPZ strains of a subspecies that does not exist in this country. It is clear that the several HIV-1 and HIV-2 strains descend from SIV-CPZ, siv and SIV-SMM viruses, and that bushmeat practice provides the most plausible venue for cross-species transfer to humans. However, some loose ends remain unresolved. It is not yet explained why only four HIV groups spread considerably in human populations, despite bushmeat practices being widespread in Central and West Africa, and the resulting human SIV infections being common. HIV-1 from chimpanzees and gorillas to humans It also remains unexplained why all epidemic HIV groups emerged in humans nearly simultaneously, and only in the 20th century, despite very old human exposure to SIV. Several of the theories of HIV origin accept the established knowledge of the HIV-SIV phylogenetic relationships, and also accept that bushmeat practice was the most likely cause of the initial transfer to humans. All of them propose that the simultaneous epidemic emergences of four HIV groups in the late 19th-early 20th century, and the lack of previous known emergences, are explained by new factor that appeared in the relevant African regions in that time frame. These new factor would have acted either to increase human exposures to SIV, to help it to adapt to the human organism by mutation, or to cause an initial burst of transmissions crossing an epidemiological threshold, and therefore increasing the probability of continued spread. Genetic studies of the virus suggested in 2008 that the most recent common ancestor of the HIV-1M group dates back to the Belgian Congo city of Leopoldville, circa 1910. Proponents of this dating link the HIV epidemic with the emergence of colonialism and growth of large colonial African cities, leading to social changes, including a higher degree of non-monogamous sexual activity the spread of prostitution, and the concomitant high frequency of genital ulcer diseases in nascent colonial cities. In 2014, 
a study conducted by scientists from the University of Oxford and the University of Leuven, in Belgium, revealed that because approximately one million people every year would flow through the prominent city of Kinshasa, which served as the origin of the first known HIV cases in the 1920s, passengers riding on the region's Belgian railway trains were able to spread the virus to larger areas. The study also attributed a roaring sex trade, rapid population growth and unsterilized needles used in health clinics as other factors which contributed to the emergence of the Africa HIV epidemic. Beatrice Hahn, Paul M. Sharp and their colleagues proposed that most likely reflects changes in population structure and behavior in Africa during the 20th century and perhaps medical interventions that provided the opportunity for rapid human-to-human -human spread of the virus. After the scramble for Africa started in the 1880s, European colonial powers established cities, towns, and other colonial stations. A largely masculine labor force was hastily recruited to work in fluvial and sea ports, railways, other infrastructures, and in plantations. This disrupted traditional tribal values and favored casual sexual activity with an increased number of partners. In the nascent cities women felt relatively liberated from rural tribal rules and many remained unmarried or divorced during long periods this being rare in African traditional societies. This was accompanied by unprecedented increase in people's movements. Michael Warobe and colleagues observed that the growth of cities probably played a role in the epidemic emergence of HIV, since the phylogenetic dating of the two older strains of HIV-1, suggest that these viruses started to spread soon after the main central African colonial cities were founded. Amit Chitnis, Diana Rawls and Jim Moore proposed that HIV may have emerged epidemically as a result of the harsh conditions, forced labor, displacement, and unsafe injection and vaccination practices associated with colonialism, particularly in French Equatorial Africa. The workers in plantations, construction projects, and other colonial enterprises were supplied with bush meat, which would have contributed to an increase in hunting and, it follows, a higher incidence of human exposure to SIV. Several historical sources support the view that bush meat hunting indeed increased both because of the necessity to supply workers and because firearms became more widely available. HIV-2 from Sudi Meng Abbeys to Humans Bushmeat Practice The colonial authorities also gave many vaccinations against smallpox, and injections, of which many would be made without sterilizing the equipment between uses. Chitnis Etal proposed that both these parenteral risks and the prostitution associated with forced labor camps could have caused serial transmission of SIV between humans. In addition, they proposed that the conditions of extreme stress associated with forced labor could depress the immune system of workers, therefore prolonging the primary acute infection period of someone newly infected by SIV thus increasing the odds of both adaptation of the virus to humans, and of further transmissions. Emergence Unresolved questions about HIV origins and emergence Origin and epidemic emergence Social changes and urbanization Colonialism in Africa the authors proposed that HIV-1 originated in the area of French Equatorial Africa in the early 20th century. Later researches proved these predictions mostly correct, HIV-1 groups M and O started to spread in humans in late 19th early 20th century. In addition, all groups of HIV-1 descend from either SIV-CPZ or SIV-GER from apes living to the west of the Ubangi River, 
either in countries that belong to the French Equatorial Africa Federation of Colonies, in Equatorial Guinea, or in Cameroon. This theory was later dubbed Heart of Darkness by Jim Moore, alluding to the book of the same title written by Joseph Conrad, the main focus of which is colonial abuses in Equatorial Africa. In several articles published since 2001, Preston Marx, Philip Alcabes, and Ernest Drucker proposed that HIV emerged because of rapid serial human-to-human -human transmission of SIV through unsafe or unsterile injections. Although both Chitnus ETAL and Sharp ETAL also suggested that this may have been one of the major risk factors at play in HIV emergence. Marx ETAL enunciated the underlying mechanisms in greater detail, and wrote the first review of the injection campaigns made in colonial Africa. Unsterile Injections Central to Marx ETAL argument is the concept of adaptation by serial passage, an adventitious virus can increase its biological adaptation to a new host species if it is rapidly transmitted between hosts, while each host is still in the acute infection period. This process favors the accumulation of adaptive mutations more rapidly, therefore increasing the odds that a better adapted viral variant will appear in the host before the immune system suppresses the virus. Such better adapted variant could then survive in the human host for longer than the short acute infection period, in high numbers, which would grant it more possibilities of epidemic spread. Marx ETAL reported experiments of cross-species transfer of SIV in captive monkeys, in which the use of serial passage helped to adapt SIV to the new monkey species after passage by three or four animals. In agreement with this model is also the fact that, while both HIV-1 and HIV-2 attain substantial viral loads in the human organism, adventitious SIV infecting humans seldom does so, people with SIV antibodies often have very low or even undetectable SIV viral load. This suggests that both HIV-1 and HIV-2 are adapted to humans and serial passage could have been the process responsible for it. Marx ETAL proposed that unsterile injections, which were likely very prevalent in Africa, during both the colonial period and afterwards, provided the mechanism of serial passage that permitted HIV to adapt to humans, therefore explaining why it emerged epidemically only in the 20th century. Marx ETAL emphasized the massive number of injections administered in Africa after antibiotics were introduced as being the most likely implicated in the origin of HIV because, by these times, injection intensity in Africa was maximal. They argued that a serial passage chain of three or four transmissions between humans is an unlikely event and so HIV emergence may have required the very high frequency of injections of the antibiotic era. The molecular dating studies place the initial spread of the epidemic HIV groups before that time. According to Marx ETAL, these studies could have overestimated the age of the HIV groups, because they depend on a molecular clock assumption, may not have accounted for the effects of natural selection in the viruses, and the serial passage process alone would be associated with strong natural selection. David Giselquist proposed that the mass injection campaigns to treat trypanosomiasis in Central Africa were responsible for the emergence of HIV-1. Unlike Marx ETAL, Giselquist argued that the millions of unsafe injections administered during these campaigns were sufficient to spread rare HIV infections into an epidemic, and that evolution of HIV through serial passage was not essential to the emergence of the HIV epidemic in the 20th century. Massive Injections of the Antibiotic Era 
This theory focuses on injection campaigns that peaked in the period 1910-40, that is, around the time the HIV-1 groups started to spread. It also focuses on the fact that many of the injections in these campaigns were intravenous, and many of the patients received many injections per year, therefore increasing the odds of SIV serial passage. Jacques Pepin and Annie Claude Lab reviewed the colonial health reports of Cameroon and French Equatorial Africa for the period 1921-59 calculating the incidences of the diseases requiring intravenous injections. They concluded that trypanosomiasis, leprosy, yaws, and syphilis were responsible for most intravenous injections. Schistosomiasis, tuberculosis, and vaccinations against smallpox represented lower parenteral risks. Schistosomiasis cases were relatively few, Tuberculosis patients only became numerous after mid-century, and there were few smallpox vaccinations in the lifetime of each person. Injection Campaigns Against Sleeping Sickness The authors suggested that the very high prevalence of the hepatitis C virus in southern Cameroon and forested areas of French Equatorial Africa can be better explained by the unsterile injections used to treat yaws because this disease was much more prevalent than syphilis, trypanosomiasis, and leprosy in these areas. They suggested that all these parenteral risks caused not only the massive spread of hepatitis C but also the spread of other pathogens, and the emergence of HIV-1, the same procedures could have exponentially amplified HIV-1 from a single hunter-slash-cook occupationally infected with SIV-CPZ to several thousand patients treated with arsenicals or other drugs, a threshold beyond which sexual transmission could prosper. They do not suggest specifically serial passage as the mechanism of adaptation. According to Pepin's 2011 book, The Origins of AIDS, the virus can be traced to a Central African bush hunter in 1921, with colonial medical campaigns using improperly sterilized syringe and needles playing a key role in enabling a future epidemic. Pepin concludes that AIDS spread silently in Africa for decades, fueled by urbanization and prostitution since the initial cross-species infection. Pepin also claims that the virus was brought to the Americas by a Haitian teacher returning home from Zaire in the 1960s. Sex tourism and contaminated blood transfusion centers ultimately propelled AIDS to public consciousness in the 1980s and a worldwide pandemic. Other Early Injection Campaigns Genital Ulcer Diseases and Evolution of Sexual Activity Probable Time Interval of Cross-Species Transfer Jao Dinis de Souza, Victor Muller, Philippe Limi, and Anmika Van Dam proposed that HIV became epidemic through sexual serial transmission, in nascent colonial cities, helped by a high frequency of genital ulcers, caused by genital ulcer diseases. Good are simply sexually transmitted diseases that cause genital ulcers, Examples are syphilis, chancroid, lymphogranuloma venereum, and genital herpes. These diseases increase the probability of HIV transmission dramatically, from around 0.010.1% to 443% per heterosexual act, because the genital ulcers provide a portal of viral entry and contain many activated T-cells expressing the CCR5CO receptor, the main cell targets of HIV. SUSA et al. use molecular dating techniques to estimate the time when each HIV group split from its closest SIV lineage. Each HIV group necessarily crossed to humans between this time and the time when it started to spread because after the MRCA certainly all lineages were already in humans, and before the split with the closest simian strain, the lineage was in a simian. 
HIV-1 groups M and O split from their closest SIVs around 1931 and 1915, respectively. This information, together with the datations of the HIV groups MRCAs, mean that all HIV groups likely crossed to humans in the early 20th century. The authors reviewed colonial medical articles and archived medical reports of the countries at or near the ranges of chimpanzees, gorillas, and Sudi Mang Abbeys, and found that genital ulcer diseases peaked in the colonial cities during their early growth period. The colonial authorities recruited men to work in railways, fluvial and sea ports, and other infrastructure projects and most of these men did not bring their wives with them. Then, the highly male-biased sex ratio favored prostitution, which in its turn caused an explosion of good. After the mid-1930s, people's movements were more tightly controlled, and mass surveys and treatments were organized, and so the good incidences started to decline. They declined even further after World War II, because of the heavy use of antibiotics, so that, by the late 1950s, Leopoldville had a very low good incidence. Similar processes happened in the cities of Cameroon and Ivory Coast, where HIV-1 Group O and HIV-2 respectively evolved. Therefore, the peak good incidences in cities have a good temporal coincidence with the period when all main HIV groups crossed to humans and started to spread. In addition, the authors gathered evidence that syphilis and the other goods were, like injections, absent from the densely forested areas of Central and West Africa before organized colonialism socially disrupted these areas. Thus, this theory also potentially explains why HIV emerged only after the late 19th century. Uli Link has argued that the practice of female genital mutilation is responsible for the high incidence of AIDS in Africa, since intercourse with a female who has undergone clitoridectomy is conducive to exchange of blood. Male circumcision may reduce the probability of HIV acquisition by men. Leaving aside blood transfusions, the highest HIV-1 transmissibility ever measured was from good-suffering female prostitutes to uncircumcised men the measured risk was 43% in a single sexual act. Sousa Etal reasoned that the adaptation and epidemic emergence of each HIV group may have required such extreme conditions and thus reviewed the existing ethnographic literature for patterns of male circumcision and hunting of apes and monkeys for bush meat, focusing on the period 1880-1960, and on most of the 318 ethnic groups living in Central and West Africa. They also collected censuses and other literature showing the ethnic composition of colonial cities in this period. Then. They estimated the circumcision frequencies of the Central African cities over time. Sousa Etal charts reveal that male circumcision frequencies were much lower in several cities of Western and Central Africa in the early 20th century than they are currently. The reason is that many ethnic groups not performing circumcision by that time gradually adopted it to imitate other ethnic groups and enhance the social acceptance of their boys. About 15-30% of men in Leopoldville and Douala in the early 20th century should be uncircumcised, and these cities were the probable centers of HIV-1 groups M and O, respectively. The authors studied early circumcision frequencies in 12 cities of Central and West Africa to test if this variable correlated with HIV emergence. This correlation was strong for HIV-2, among six West African cities that could have received immigrants infected with SIVSMM, the two cities from the Ivory Coast studied had much higher frequency of uncircumcised men than the others, and epidemic HIV-2 groups emerged initially in this country only. 
This correlation was less clear for HIV-1 in Central Africa. Sousa et al. then built computer simulations to test if an ill-adapted SIV could spread in colonial cities. The simulations used parameters of sexual transmission obtained from the current HIV literature. They modeled people's sexual links, with different levels of sexual partner change among different categories of people according to data obtained from modern studies of sexual activity in African cities. The simulations let the parameters vary, and explored several scenarios. Each scenario was run 1,000 times, to test the probability of SIV generating long chains of sexual transmission. The authors postulated that such long chains of sexual transmission were necessary for the SIV strain to adapt better to humans, becoming an HIV capable of further epidemic emergence. The main result was that genital ulcer frequency was by far the most decisive factor. For the good levels prevailing in Leopoldville in the early 20th century, long chains of SIV transmission had a high probability. For the lower good levels existing in the same city in the late 1950s, they were much less likely. And without good SIV could not spread at all. City size was not an important factor. The authors propose that these findings explain the temporal patterns of HIV emergence. No HIV emerging in tens of thousands of years of human slaughtering of apes and monkeys, several HIV groups emerging in the nascent, good-riddled, colonial cities, and no epidemically successful HIV group emerging in mid-20th century, when good was more controlled, and cities were much bigger. Male circumcision had little to moderate effect in their simulations, but, Given the geographical correlation found, the authors propose that it could have had an indirect role, either by increasing genital ulcer disease itself, or by permitting further spread of the HIV strain, after the first chains of sexual transmission permitted adaptation to the human organism. One of the main advantages of this theory is stressed by the authors. It also offers a conceptual simplicity because it proposes as causal factors for SIV adaptation to humans and initial spread the very same factors that most promote the continued spread of HIV nowadays, promiscuous sex, particularly involving sex workers, good, and possibly lack of circumcision. Iatrogenic theories propose that medical interventions were responsible for HIV origins. By proposing factors that only appeared in Central and West Africa after the late 19th century, they seek to explain why all HIV groups also started after that. The theories centered on the role of parenteral risks such as unsterile injections, transfusions, or smallpox vaccinations are accepted as plausible by most scientists of the field. Discredited HIV-AIDS origins theories include several iatrogenic theories, such as the polio vaccine hypothesis which argues that the early oral polio vaccines were contaminated with a chimpanzee virus, leading to the Central African outbreak. In most non-human primate species, natural SIV infection does not cause a fatal disease. Comparison of the gene sequence of SIV with HIV should, therefore, give us information about the factors necessary to cause disease in humans. The factors that determine the virulence of HIV as compared to most SIVs are only now being elucidated. Non-human SIVs contain an F gene that downregulates CD3, CD4, and MHC class I expression. Most non-human SIVs, therefore, do not induce immunodeficiency. The HIV-1 NEF gene, however, has lost its ability to downregulate CD3, 
which results in the immune activation and apoptosis that is characteristic of chronic HIV infection. In addition, a long-term survey of chimpanzees naturally infected with SIVCPZ in GOM, Tanzania found that, contrary to the previous paradigm, chimpanzees with SIVCPZ infection do experience an increased mortality, and also suffer from a human AIDS-like illness. SIV pathogenicity in wild animals could exist in other chimpanzee subspecies and other primate species as well, and stay unrecognized by lack of relevant long-term studies. David Carr was an apprentice printer from Manchester, England who died August 31, 1959, and was for some time mistakenly reported to have died from AIDS-defining opportunistic infections. Following the failure of his immune system, he succumbed to pneumonia. Doctors, baffled by what he had died from, preserved 50 of his tissue samples for inspection. In 1990, the tissues were found to be HIV positive. However, in 1992, a second test by AIDS researcher David Ho found that the strain of HIV present in the tissues was similar to those found in 1990 rather than an earlier strain. He concluded that the DNA samples provided actually came from a 1990 AIDS patient. Upon retesting David Carr's tissues, he found no sign of the virus. One of the earliest documented HIV-1 infections was discovered in a preserved blood sample taken in 1959 from a man from Leopoldville in the Belgian Congo. However, it is unknown whether this anonymous person ever developed AIDS and died of its complications. A second early documented HIV-1 infection was discovered in a preserved lymph node biopsy sample taken in 1960 from a woman from Leopoldville, Belgian Congo. In May 1969 16-year-old African-American Robert Rayford died at the St. Louis City Hospital from Kaposi's sarcoma. In 1987 researchers at Tulane University School of Medicine detected a virus closely related or identical to HIV-1 in his preserved blood and tissues. The doctors who worked on his case at the time suspected he was a prostitute or the victim of sexual abuse, though the patient did not discuss his sexual history with them in detail. In 1975 and 1976, a Norwegian sailor, with the alias name Arvid No, his wife, and his seven-year-old daughter died of AIDS. The sailor had first presented symptoms in 1969, eight years after he first spent time in ports along the West African coastline. A gonorrhea infection during his first African voyage shows he was sexually active at this time. Tissue samples from the sailor and his wife were tested in 1988 and found to contain HIV-1. From 1972 to 1973, researchers drew blood from 75 children in Uganda to serve as controls for a study of Burkitt's lymphoma. In 1985, Retroactive testing of the frozen blood serum indicated that antibodies to a virus related to HIV were present in 50 of the children. HIV-1 strains were once thought to have arrived in New York City from Haiti around 1971. It spread from New York City to San Francisco around 1976. HIV-1 is believed to have arrived in Haiti from Central Africa, possibly from the Democratic Republic of the Congo around 1967. The current consensus is that HIV was introduced to Haiti by an unknown individual or individuals who contracted it while working in the Democratic Republic of the Congo circa 1966, or from another person who worked there during that time. A mini-epidemic followed, and, circa 1969, 
yet another unknown individual took HIV from Haiti to the United States. The vast majority of cases of AIDS outside Sub-Saharan Africa can be traced back to that single patient. The virus eventually entered male gay communities in large United States cities, where a combination of casual, multi-partner sexual activity and relatively high transmission rates associated with anal intercourse allowed it to spread explosively enough to finally be noticed. Because of the long incubation period of HIV before symptoms of AIDS appear, and, because of the initially low incidence, HIV was not noticed at first. By the time the first reported cases of AIDS were found in large United States cities, the prevalence of HIV infection in some communities had passed 5%. Worldwide, HIV infection has spread from urban to rural areas, and has appeared in regions such as China and India. A Canadian airline steward named Gaetan Dugas was referred to as Case 057 and later Patient O with the alphabet letter O standing for outside Southern California, in an early AIDS study by Dr. William Darrow of the Centers for Disease Control. Because of this, many people had considered Dugas to be responsible for taking HIV to North America. However, HIV reached New York City around 1971 while Dugas did not start work at Air Canada until 1974. In Randy Schilt's 1987 book and the band played on, Dugas is referred to as AIDS Patient Zero instead of Patient O, but neither the book nor the movie states that he had been the first to bring the virus to North America. He was incorrectly called Patient Zero because at least 40 of the 248 people known to be infected by HIV in 1983 had had sex with him, or with someone who had sexual intercourse with him. The AIDS epidemic officially began on June 5, 1981 when the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in its Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report newsletter reported unusual clusters of pneumocystis pneumonia caused by a form of pneumocystis carinae in five homosexual men in Los Angeles. Over the next 18 months, more PCP clusters were discovered among otherwise healthy men in cities throughout the country along with other opportunistic diseases and persistent, generalized lymphadenopathy, common in immunosuppressed patients. In June 1982, a report of a group of cases amongst gay men in Southern California suggested that a sexually transmitted infectious agent might be the etiological agent, and the syndrome was initially termed GRID, or gay-related immune deficiency. Health authorities soon realized that nearly half of the people identified with the syndrome were not homosexual men. The same opportunistic infections were also reported among hemophiliacs, users of intravenous drugs such as heroin, and Haitian immigrants leading some researchers to call it the 4-H disease. By August 1982, the disease was being referred to by its new CDC coined name, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. In May 1983, a team of doctors at the Pasteur Institute in France including Francoise Barcinacy and Luc Montagnier reported that they had isolated a new retrovirus from lymphoid ganglions that they believed was the cause of AIDS. The virus was later named lymphadenopathy-associated virus and a sample was sent to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, which was later passed to the National Cancer Institute. In May 1984 a team led by Robert Gallo of the United States confirmed the discovery of the virus, but they renamed it Human T Lymphotropic Virus Type 3. Dr. J. Levy's group at the University of California, San Francisco also played a role in the discovery of HIV. He independently isolated the AIDS virus in 1983 and named it the AIDS-associated retrovirus, 
publishing his findings in the journal Science in 1984. In January 1985, a number of more detailed reports were published concerning LAV and HTLV3, and by March it was clear that the viruses were the same dash indeed, it was later determined that the virus isolated by the Gallo lab was from the lymph nodes of the patient studied in the original 1983 report by Montagnier Dash and was the etiological agent of AIDS. In May 1986, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses ruled that both names should be dropped and a new name, HIV, be used. Whether Gallo or Montagnier deserve more credit for the discovery of the virus that causes AIDS has been a matter of considerable controversy. Together with his colleague Francois Barsinesi, Montagnier was awarded one half of the 2008 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of human immunodeficiency virus. Harold Zuerhausen also shared the prize for his discovery that human papillomavirus leads to cervical cancer, but Gallo was left out. Gallo said that it was a disappointment that he was not named a CO recipient. Montagnier said he was surprised Gallo was not recognized by the Nobel Committee, it was important to prove that HIV was the cause of AIDS, and Gallo had a very important role in that. I'm very sorry for Robert Gallo. Dr. Levy's contribution to the discovery of HIV was also cited in the Nobel Prize ceremony. Strong Good Incidents in Nascent Colonial Cities Since June 5, 1981, many definitions have been developed for epidemiological surveillance such as the Bongi definition and the 1994 expanded World Health Organization AIDS case definition. According to a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2008, a team led by Robert Schaefer at Stanford University School of Medicine has discovered that the gray mouse lemur has an endogenous lentivirus in its genetic makeup. This suggests that lentiviruses have existed for at least 14 million years, much longer than the currently known existence of HIV. In addition, the time frame falls in the period when Madagascar was still connected to what is now the African continent. The said lemurs later developed immunity to the virus strain and survived an era when the lentivirus was widespread among other mammalia. The study is being hailed as crucial, because it fills the blanks in the origin of the virus, as well as in its evolution, and may be important in the development of new antiviral drugs. In 2010, Researchers reported that SIV had infected monkeys in Bioko for at least 32,000 years. Previous to this time, it was thought that SIV infection in monkeys had happened over the past few hundred years. Scientists estimated that it would take a similar amount of time before humans adapted naturally to HIV infection in the way monkeys in Africa have adapted to SIV and not suffer any harm from the infection. A 2016 Czech study of the genome of Malayan flying lemurs, an order of mammals parallel to primates and sharing an immediate common ancestor with them found endogenous lentiviruses that emerged an estimated 40 to 60 million years ago based on rates of viral mutation versus modern lentiviruses. Other hypotheses for the origin of AIDS have been proposed. AIDS denialism argues that HIV or AIDS does not exist or that AIDS is not caused by HIV. Some of its proponents believe that AIDS is caused by lifestyle, including sexuality or drug use, and not by HIV. Some conspiracy theories allege that HIV was created in a bioweapons laboratory, perhaps as an agent of genocide or an accident. These hypotheses have been rejected by scientific consensus, it is generally accepted among pathologists that, the evidence that HIV causes AIDS is scientifically conclusive, 
and most scientific arguments for denialism are based on misrepresentations of outdated data. Female Genital Mutilation Male Circumcision Distribution and HIV Origins Computer Simulations of HIV Emergence Iatrogenic and Other Theories Pathogenicity of SIV in Non-Human Primates History of Spread 1959, David Carr 1959, Congolese Man 1960, Congolese Woman 1969, Robert Rayford 1969, Arvid No 1973, Ugandan Children Spread to the Western Hemisphere Canadian Flight Attendant Theory 1981-1982, From Grid to AIDS Identification of the Virus May 1983, LAV May 1984, HTLV-3 August 1984, ARV January 1985, both found to be the same. May 1986, the name HIV. Nobel Case Definition for Epidemiological Surveillance Genetic Studies Discredited Hypotheses Notes